sing the songs we sing, how do we choose music for the liturgy? And there are many different ways of doing this. Perhaps you can identify with some or one of these. Perhaps you just look and see what you sang last year on this Sunday. Well, that doesn't usually work because the readings are different than they were last year on this Sunday. Some feasts that might be helpful. I know that many musicians read the scriptures for the day, to try to get a flavor of the scriptures, perhaps identify certain themes or images or metaphors. I know that when I was planning music many years ago, I would just take out the planning sheet and start at the first item and start filling the blanks. Some of you, by the look of your faces, are doing that. <laughs> Some uh, musicians simply identify four hymns and they say the rest will look after itself. <laughs> or the rest is the same as last week. Some people actually start with the Eucharistic acclamations, recognizing that these are among the most important things that we sing at the Sunday Eucharist. Others will start with the Responsorial Psalm, knowing that the Responsorial Psalm is unique to this particular Sunday or this particular feast. So let's get that one out of the way first. And I think maybe all too many Go to our favorite hymns. This is what we like, so they better like it too. Simple as that. I'm not going to suggest that any of these ways of selecting music are all wrong. Because there is a value in each one of them. But I'd like to explore with you this evening some basic principles or priorities or issues that we should take into account, no matter how we are uh, planning and selecting music for the Sunday liturgy. And by the way, I want to say that I'm going to be talking about the Sunday liturgy, but the principles that I will be enunciating apply to the celebration of marriage, or funerals, or baptisms, or confirmations, or ordinations, any liturgical celebration. The same principles apply. So you'll have to do the translation. I'm going to talk about Sunday Eucharist. You translate yourselves to the other rituals that uh, you'll be looking at this week with Father Bill. In terms of a starting point, there are simply two points I want to make. All liturgical music is, first of all, for the praise of God. And secondly, for the sanctification of God's people. That statement comes from Pope Pius X in 1903. It's a long-standing liturgical musical principle. It's been around for over 100 years. The purpose of all liturgical music is first for the praise of God, secondly, for the sanctification of God's people. I rephrase that slightly in the second statement. The object of all liturgical music is God. All liturgical music is directed to God. God is the object, or the receiver, if you will. The subject of liturgical music is the ascetic. It's us. We are the ones who make the liturgical music. We do the singing or the music making. So we are the subjects. God is the object. And that's a very important principle to keep in mind, particularly when you look at texts. Who is the text addressed to? If it's addressed to you, put a big question mark beside it. Somewhere in the text, we should say something to God, because God is the object of liturgical music. 
Now, it doesn't mean that in every line, every verse, you have to say something wrong. But somewhere in the hymn, or somewhere in the acclamation, or somewhere in the refrain, we should say something to God. We can ask God for something, we can tell God something, we can praise God for something, but somewhere we talk to God. So something to keep in mind. Now these are the four, uh, I'm calling them priorities, that we ought to be looking at as we go about the task of selecting liturgical music. The first one is not found anywhere else that I'm aware of, except I'll point out that it's in the general instruction of the Roman Missal. But the last three, the liturgical, pastoral, and musical priorities, these were first enunciated in 1983 by the American Bishops' Conference in a little book that they did on liturgical music today had a, a sequel to it, and I can't remember the name of it, uh, but it's liturgical music today, the United States Bishops, 1983. These three principles uh, were enunciated, that we ought to look at the music, quality of music, we ought to look at how it functions in the liturgy, and we ought to look at, as Father Bill said last night, the other. We need to know the people the assembly, the community that is uh, performing the music, the singing music. So these are the four that I'd like to review with you uh, this evening. Now, if you have read this book, The General Instruction of the Roman Missal, and if you have read this very excellent book, <laughs> Canyon to the Catholic Book of Worship Number 3, Guidelines for Liturgical Music, you can close your ears because you've read everything that I'm going to say. But if you haven't read these cover to cover and memorized them, then you need to listen. Sorry. Now, I'm going to put on this screen a number of quotes. I'm not going to read them to you. You can read along as I'm talking. And uh, I suspect that by the end of this, somebody will say, can we get a copy of that? Yes, you can, and I'll mention it at the end. So you don't have to write madly, because you'll have writers cramped in about three minutes. So let's look, first of all, at the ministerial priorities. Now, as I said, these are not enunciated in the American Bishop Statement. I'm not aware of any other place that they're actually uh, described in this way. But the content of this section of my talk is found in the General Instruction of the Roman Missal. And we're starting with the assembly. And there are two quotes there, both from paragraph 40 of the general instruction of the Roman Missal. That's what germ stands for when you see it on the street. The first thing is that the people's song, the song of the people, of the entire assembly, is a primary objective. We need to always keep in mind that the first minister of music in any liturgical assembly is the assembly itself. The people, the congregation, call us what you will. The first point makes the uh, observation that music, and music sung by the ministers and the people together, is not an option on Sunday the day of the Lord, at Sunday Mass. Any parish that has a quiet, silent Mass on Sunday morning is in violation of church law. <laughs> Those who want to have a nice, quiet Sunday morning Mass, tell them they're being disobedient to the Pope. Okay? We are to have some music. That doesn't mean you have to sing absolutely everything that's singable. But it's integral to Sunday liturgy that there be music and that there be song by the ministers and the assembly, the people. The second point here is very foundational for much of the rest of what we're going to say tonight. When we are choosing the parts of the Mass, what are we going to sing? 
the priority is given to those parts of the Mass where the priests and the people are in dialogue. Now again, this is the law of the Church. This is the general instruction of the Roman Missal. I'm not making it up. Even though, I suspect, if we had a show of hands, almost none of us in this room observe this. So here is a goal, a goal for us, to start working on those dialogues, those uh, proclamations and responses, conversations between the priest and the assembly. I suspect that there would be a significant number in this group who would be familiar with singing the preface. That's one of those dialogues. But just out of curiosity, how many of you sing the sign of the cross at the beginning of Mass? One, two, three. Well, you don't count your both the same parish. Three. Okay. Two parishes. Same parish? Okay. Two parishes. You see my point. Uh, the greetings, for example, at the beginning of Mass, or the greeting before the gospel, or the acclamations after the readings of Scripture. These are all uh, dialogues between the priests and people. Music is provided in the Roman Missal. And these are things that ought to be sung. Now, we have to start somewhere. So if you're starting, start with a preface. That's the one that most people already know. Maybe they have to learn the new notes, the new words. But it's at least in people's memory. And then gradually, start on some of the other uh, responses, okay? So that's the first priority, and I point that out because it's not in place in most of our parishes. And uh, I think most of us are not even aware of it. Most priests are not aware of it. And certainly the folks in the few aren't. Which one's the preface? The preface is, the Lord be with you, and with your spirit, lift up your hearts. goes on also talk about that there is preference given to certain parts of the Mass. Now, it's not fleshed out so well here, but it will be fleshed out further on this. So that's the assembly. Let's be really clear. The assembly is the first minister of music, first minister of song. The cantor. The cantor's role, of course, is to sing the responsorial song. I don't need to say much more about that, except that uh, the song is a psalm, and psalms are to be sung. We are encouraged to sing the psalms, the responsorial psalm. And we'll see in a moment, under liturgical principles, that there is the option to sing the psalm straight through. It's, it's an option. But the norm is to sing it responsorially, back and forth between the cantor and the assembly. That's why it's called a responsorial song. It has to do with the way it's sung, not the fact that it's a response to the first reading, because it's also a proclamation of scripture, as is the first reading. So we need to look at the role of the cantor. Now in our liturgical books, the cantor is usually distinguished from a leader of song. The cantor in the liturgical books usually means the one who sings the song or the psalmist. In practice, in most of our parishes, the cantor and the leader of the song is the same person. Most of our parishes, we don't have such large groups of musicians that we can have two or three exercising those various ministries at one celebration. So for our purposes, oftentimes it's uh, Two, two jobs, one person. Um, we'll say more about the song later. The role of the choir needs to be identified and I think clarified. In the general instruction, it states that among the faithful, so the presumption is everybody is singing, the scola cantorum or the choir 
exercise is a liturgical function, and its function is uh, taking care of the parts proper to them. Singing, I think there's a typo there. The parts proper to them uh, are to be sung, and that they would then foster the uh, participation of the whole assembly. So it's very clear that the role of the choir is not to perform or provide filler at certain moments. The choir is to sing those parts that are proper to them. Their role is also to lead the assembly. And while it doesn't say, say here in these words, I would suggest it's also to augment the song of the assembly, you know, to provide harmonies and uh, you know, descants and uh, uh, embellishments that the assembly is not capable of singing. But the primary role of, of the choir is to lead the assembly. And then the instruction is very insightful because it realizes that not every parish or not in every mass is there a choir. So where there is no choir, the leader of song exercises his or her ministry. And again, it's to direct the different chants with the people taking part, the part that is proper to them. We'll talk more about the proper parts to them when we look at the liturgical principles or liturgical priorities. <laughs> now, I mentioned here on the slide a reference to the priests. There's only about one three in the room tonight. But just so the rest of you know, the general instruction of the Roman Missal is very clear in encouraging, promoting, not quite mandating, but certainly encouraging and promoting singing by the priest. And obviously, if we're going to have chants, which are dialogues between the priest and the people, the priest has to do his part. The priest has to be trained to do his part, just as the people have to be trained to do their part. We all need training. We all need to practice. Uh, but just so that you know, if you're looking at the issue of priest and song, look at paragraph 40 of the general instruction of the Roman Missal. So those are what I would call the ministerial priorities. Let's be clear whose job is what. And that needs to be taken into account when you start selecting music. We'll move on to the liturgical priorities. And in general, the liturgical priority for the assembly is, as I mentioned, the dialogues and the responses. And I've just listed some of them. There are more of them than that. But those are some of the more obvious and common uh, dialogues and responses. Uh, the sign of the cross is reading the Amen, if the collect or the opening prayer is sung, as it was, for example, at morning prayer today. That's a, a response for the people. Acclamations following scripture readings, preface dialogue, blessing and dismissal. One of the things that we notice in the new Roman Missal is that there is a lot more music for the priests and the people than we were accustomed to seeing in the previous missal. For example, during the communion rite, the prayer for peace, Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave with you, peace I give you, look not on the, our sins, but on the faith of the church, etc. There's music for that. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. There is music for that in the Missal. And as we, over the next several years, maybe decades, but hopefully not decades, <laughs> but over the next several years, as we start to get used to the new Missal, and start to explore the musical possibilities in the order of Mass, some of these things might be sung in our parishes. 
I think if we were to sing them all next Sunday, everybody would be in shock. <laughs> we wouldn't know what to do. But over a number of years, we can start to introduce some of these items so that the Mass is not a matter of singing at Mass, but singing the Mass. Okay? So that's the first priority. The rest of these priorities <coughs> really refer to different parts of the Mass. And I know that for some of you this will be a little bit of a review, but it's a good review. It's worth doing. The entrance song or the chant. This is sung by the priests and the ministers and the assembly. Everybody is intended to be participating in this entrance song. By the way, it says there, entrance song, and in brackets, chant. I want to say a word about that. In the general instruction and in the Roman Missal, you do not see the word song. I don't think you see it anywhere. It's always chant. The reference is always to the entrance chant, the offertory chant, the communion chant. That does not mean entrance Gregorian chant. Offertory Gregorian chant. Chant is simply the term for music, sung music. Okay? So when you see that term, don't get uptight and oh, we were singing the wrong thing, too. So something else we're supposed to be singing. It's the music that we sing together. The purpose of this entrance song is to open the celebration, foster unity, uh, introduce the mystery for the time of feast, and accompany the procession. So what kind of a song do you pick for the entrance? You don't sing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel on the first Sunday of Lent. Because <laughs> it's not introducing the mystery of the liturgical time. You don't sing a very gentle lullaby, which is going to put people to sleep, when you want to gather them together for the very first song that they're going to sing in the whole celebration. The song that's going to bind them together. You don't sing a meditative hymn when you're trying to get people bonded together. So keep those things in mind. What's the purpose of the song? Does the music meet that purpose? Does it match the function of the song? In architecture, they talk about form following function. Well, this is the function of the entrance song. What form is going to match it? What kind of music is going to match it? Okay? So that's the entrance chant. The Kyrie. After the penitential act, the Kyrie lay song is always begun. Uh, obviously, we know that it can be recited. And recite Lord have mercy or Kyrie eleison, or we can sing. And there are many theories around. If we're singing the Gloria, maybe we might recite the Kyrie, or we might sing both. A lot will depend on the solemnity of the occasion. It will depend on uh, the, I'm going to call this the musical tolerance of your assembly. Uh, it might depend on the abilities of the music ministers different factors. Those are the pastoral judgments. But it, it can be sung, it may be sung, it's encouraged to be sung, and in that song we acclaim the Lord and implore his mercy. Notice it says, it is usually executed by everyone. This is not a choir piece or cantor and choir. It's meant to be sung by everyone. Okay. The rest you can read yourself. And you can extend it. You know, perhaps during Lent, it's a penitential season. Maybe sing it more than three times. Make it into a litany. That's possible. Rome says you can do it. The glory. Glory to God in the highest. It's one of those stand-alone items, stand-alone rights. Uh, Father Bill talked about the gospel acclamation. 
that it's a right in and of itself. There's movement going on, but it's a right in and of itself. I would say that even more so for the glory. This is one hymn, I think it's the only hymn, certainly at, at Sunday Mass. There are some hymns in the ordination rite and other rites, but at Mass, this is the only hymn that we simply stand and sing and nothing else is going on. You think of the entrance hymn. Well, there's movement, there's a procession going on. Communion hymn, procession going on. Offertory chant, there's procession going on, movement going on, the table's being set. What goes on during the Gloria? Zippo, nothing. It's a stand-alone hymn. It's unique. We just praise God to praise God, and we're not doing anything else but. It. So the Gloria has a very special place in the Sunday Eucharist. It's in the Sunday Eucharist because it is the day of the Lord, the day of the resurrection. So we praise God for the gift of Jesus and what he has done for us in forgiving our sins and dying and rising and being raised as Lord, seated at the right hand of the Father. Gloria originally was an Easter morning hymn in morning prayer before it was ever introduced into the Mass. So it's very connected with Easter, with Sunday, with the Lord's Day, and as I said, it's a standalone hymn. I know a number of you have heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again for the sake of those who haven't heard this. The Gloria is a song, and songs are sung. It's permitted to recite the Gloria, in my opinion, and it's my opinion only, well, I share it with a few others. <laughs> it's verging, verging on sinful to recite the Gloria on Sunday. You can disagree if you wish, but that's my opinion. It really needs to, it cries out to be sung. Just like you would never stand up and recite O Canada every Sunday even on Canada Day, you would, it doesn't make sense to stand up and recite glory to God in the okay? So having said that, it's intended, clearly if you read through that whole text, it's intended to be a song for the assembly, for the whole community. It does make a possibility there that it could be sung by the choir alone. It's there, but it's one of several options and in the context of the whole thing, it clearly says this is something that belongs to the assembly. Now, we've all become familiar with settings of the Gloria where we have a refrain for the assembly and the choir or the cantor sings the body of the text. And that's simply one way of introducing the assembly to the Gloria because it's long, it's not constructed metrically, so you can't sing several verses that are the same. Each verse would be different. So it's one way of engaging the assembly. Hopefully we will soon have more settings of the glory, which are what we call through composed, no refrain, and parishes will take one of those and learn it. And we find that people learn it by heart very quickly. So we all have a little uh, work to do in our parishes to work on the glory and singing it. I find it interesting that in the general instruction it says, if it is not sung, now this just underscores what I'm saying, but it, it belongs to the people. If it's not sung, it's to be recited either by everybody together or by two choirs responding to one another. Now that's something that I think is fairly foreign to us in Canada. It is not foreign in Italy. They do the same thing with the Gloria and with the Creed. If they're singing it, they do it this way. If they're reciting it, they do it this way. You say the first three lines, you say the next three lines. You say the next three lines, you say the next three lines. That's what they're talking about there, uh, two choirs responding to each other. It's not a refrain. You're just saying the whole thing, but you're splitting it up back and forth. Okay? So, enough to say about the glory except the very first sentence, which should not be ignored. The text of this hymn cannot be replaced by any other hymn. 
we are not allowed to do a paraphrase of the glory or find a hymn that happens to have the words glory to God in the highest in the refrain. Say, oh, we could do that instead. No. This text stands as it is. This is the official approved text and nothing else can substitute. That's the rule. The responsorial psalm, we talked about just very, very briefly a moment ago. But notice what it says. It is preferable that the responsorial psalm be sung at least as far as the people's response is concerned. The pattern, of course, that is most common is that we sing, the cantor sings the refrain, usually people repeat it, and then the cantor sings the verse, and the people sing the refrain each time after each verse. That is what they're talking about, the preferred way of singing the responsorial psalm. The people should at least be able to sing the refrain. And I believe it was mentioned, I think Father Bill mentioned it yesterday, or this morning, I can't remember, that the song should be sung in such a way that it fosters meditation. Meditation on the Word of God. It is the Word of God, sung, and it's sung in the context of the liturgy of the Word, with all of the rest of the scriptures being proclaimed to us. So, as we have silence after each reading to help us meditate on it, to reflect on the reading, so also the song should be set in such a way that it moves us to that silence or meditation. I think the example Father Bill gave is, is better than any I could come up with. Uh, his example from Father Jeffrey Angelus uh, in a workshop where they sang uh, the uh, Psalm 51 to a very upbeat, syncopated rhythm, and nobody, and they were clapping, and it was hardly an expression of sorrow for sin. So the text obviously has to match the music. Uh, and again, it, it's not a question of replacing it with something else. The responsorial psalm text is provided in the lectionary, in our hymn books, and that's the text that must be used. Uh, I was at a funeral recently, and I thought that this was over now, but obviously it's still going on, where they sang in the Crimmins, the Lord's my shepherd, instead of the song. The only person that was singing in the church was the cantor. And I thought to myself, she can sing that. She's certainly capable of singing the responsorial song. You know, I don't know what the excuse is that nobody can sing the response. Uh, I think everybody can just sing the response. So that's a note on the responsorial psalm. So if you're looking for a responsorial psalm, see if you have a setting where the music and the text match. And that the music and the text really move up, if they express the spirit of the song, but they also move us into meditation, to reflection. The Gospel acclamation, I don't think I need to say anything more about this than what was said already by Father Bill, that it is a standalone rite, it is an acclamation, it's a burst of praise. And if it's going to be a burst of praise, then it has to be sung very easily, very quickly, uh, quickly in the sense that it's learned very quickly, not that we have to sing it fast, but that it's, it's quickly learned. <laughs> It's also, because it's an acclamation, it's not something we change very often. Do not change the gospel acclamation as often as you change your underwear. <laughs> Keep it going for a long time. Because otherwise, it's not an acclamation. People are running, what are we doing today? We did something last week, but today's going to be different. And they can't enter into it. And most uh, musicians and liturgists would suggest that you change it perhaps seasonally. So that you have a good run with the same acclamation for a season, and then you move to another one which demarks the next season of the year. Now obviously during Lent you're not going to sing Alleluia, so you're going to change the acclamation anyways. But even uh, during the rest of the year, you may look at different seasons. And I'm not talking just about liturgical seasons, but it may be even uh, seasons of the year, or the seasons of our lives. 
Perhaps you, you sing one acclamation all summer and then in the fall when things start uh, getting back together again and the pastoral year begins, maybe you sing another acclamation through the fall and up to Advent, something like that. So uh, keep in mind that if it's going to be an acclamation and spontaneous, it can't be changing in every week. And it needs to be a, a melody that people can sing right back to. If it's so long and so complex that nobody answers you when you let the assembly sing it, or you have to sing it to the mic to make sure they get it, maybe it's not a good acclamation. Profession of faith. This is a little interesting bit of information. The creed is to be sung or said. I don't know of anywhere. I, I, I know there are places, I just don't know of them uh, in our country where people sing the creed or sing it regularly. Uh, it certainly may be sung. It's going to be difficult to sing uh, because of the length of the text. There is a setting of the uh, uh, profession of faith. It's not really a creed, but it's a profession of faith based on the Apostles' Creed in the Catholic Book of Worship, number 619, I believe. Uh, this is one musical setting. I think here's an area where a lot of composers could do the church a great service by providing us with good musical settings of the profession of faith. I remember when I was uh, studying in Italy, there was a setting of the creed. It was really a conversation between the priest and the assembly. And uh, the people's assembly, the people's response was, Credo, credo. Uh, they say it three or four times after each of the questions. So in other words, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. That's maybe one way of providing music for the creed. At the moment, I'm uh, not aware that it's really a high priority in most parishes, in most communities, but keep in mind that it could be sung. It's certainly encouraged to be sung. But I think the issue right now is that we need some musical settings that will be accessible to us and useful in our parishes. The offertory chant, and again, this is a new phrase in the Roman Missal. We used to refer to this as the hymn during the presentation of the gifts or the preparation of the altar. It's a rather cumbersome title. And uh, the title that's now used in the general instruction, uh, it's come back actually from the past, is the offertory chant. There was a reluctance on the part of many musicians and liturgists to use this term because there's no offering going on here. We're simply getting ready to make the offering in the Eucharistic prayer. However, the term has been used historically. It's back in the uh, vocabulary of the church. And simply the construction says that music may be used, some music may be used, during the preparation of the gifts, now here it does not say, by the whole assembly. So here is one place, one very obvious place, where choral music may be appropriate, or instrumental music may be appropriate, or assembly music may be appropriate. Because the document does not specify who does the singing, and it doesn't specify that you have to sing either. It makes it available. It's appropriate to do it. When we're planning our music, when we're selecting music, do we insist every single Sunday that we have to sing a hymn at this time by the assembly? Or maybe here's an area where we can have some variety. One Sunday the choir sings. Another mass, we just have instrumental music. Perhaps another mass, or the next Sunday the congregation sings. The Eucharistic prayer. In terms of the Eucharistic prayer, it speaks of the, uh, the Eucharistic acclamations. There are two of them, actually. One is specified in paragraph 79b. I neglected to put the second one up on the mystery of faith. And then the closing one, of course, is the Amen. These are acclamations, and it says, by which the whole congregation, joining the heavenly powers, Sings. The acclamation constitutes part of the Eucharistic prayer and is pronounced by all the people with the priest. Now, if you're thinking of planning music, 
when you're planning the Eucharistic acclamations, it's got to be acclamations that everybody knows and everybody sings. That's why here is a case where you don't change them often. I would say in my parish, which is a very blessed, we have good music ministry and people do sing, I would say it's only been in the last month or so that the people are really singing the Eucharistic acclamations with confidence. Not relying on the organist, not relying on the cantor choir, but they're singing them on their own with confidence. And that's been the same setting since last November. So my point is simply, don't change these very often. Because it takes people time to really, not just learn it, but then to sing it with real confidence. So they are parts for the people. This is not the place for a choral mass setting. It's a place for the people. If it is a setting, uh, for example, uh, a setting that is uh, not well known, or a setting, for example, of a, a Gregorian setting, chant setting, possibly the way to do it is to involve the people in part of it. Again, I use my example from, uh, from Rome. Oftentimes they will sing uh, Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Amo. But the choir will sing part, and then the people will sing the next section, and the choir will sing the part, and the people will sing the next section. It's another way of giving the choir some uh, leeway, if you will, to embellish, but also that the assembly is not left out of the Eucharistic acclamation. So, Keep that in mind. That's, this is one of the big priorities for the whole assembly to sing in terms of the liturgical structure of the Mass. The Lord's Prayer, it says simply that it may be sung or said. And there are pastoral reasons for singing it and for not singing it. In some communities, the singing of the Lord's Prayer is like a baby's favorite teddy bear and you do not dare take it away from them. <laughs> In other parishes, to sing the Lord's Prayer is to uh, invite a very small number in the assembly to sing and leaves the rest of the people out of the participation. You have to make the pastoral judgment here. All I'm pointing out in terms of the liturgical priority is that it may be sung or may be recited. The rest becomes a pastoral issue, a pastoral question. The August Day or the Lamb of God may be sung by the choir or cantor, that is usually sung by the choir or cantor, with the people replying. Again, here is a place for the choir and choral settings, whether it's in Latin or English or any other language, where the people at least have the response much as they do when you sing the Kyrie Lay song and the people respond. Um, once again, this is the text that's provided. If you have a setting of the Lamb of God that starts off with something like, peace I leave with you, peace I give you, delete. Just delete it, period. That is not the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God does not include any reference to or any wish for the gift of peace. The Lamb of God is a set text for the universal church, and it's the text that accompanies the breaking of the bread. It does not accompany in any way the exchange of peace. So we need to keep that in mind when we're looking at settings of the Agnus Day of the Lamb of God. Notice it says it may be repeated. If there is a lot of bread to break, uh, it may be repeated. You can sing it more than three times. The last time, of course, is always bread is peace. The communion chant is the next item. And what I did here is put the actual text from the Canadian edition of the general instruction of the Roman Missal. 
Now I put it here because it's the same text that is found with respect to the entrance chant and the offertory chant, but I didn't put the text on the screen before. It's the same basic text. In the dioceses of Canada, singing at communion may be chosen from among the following. The antiphon of the Graduale Romano, with or without the song. You all have a copy of that, I'm sure, <laughs> in your bags. Uh, or the antiphon with the song from the Grand Wally Simplex. You also have that in your bags, I'm sure. Or some other suitable liturgical chant approved by the Conference of Bishops of Canada. This is sung either by the choir alone or by the choir cantered with the people. Now, again, the options are there of what to sing. Several sources are mentioned. We are in the process, we're not there yet, but we are in the process of identifying music that is approved for use in Canada. In the general instruction, it states near the end of the instruction, 300 and something, I can't remember the paragraph number, that the bishops of the conference are responsible for approving music for liturgical use. Now, uh, in Liturgical Authenticum, a document that came out uh, over 10 years ago now, almost, the bishops were asked to send a list to Rome. These are the hymns that are approved for use in Canada. And it was to be done in five years' time. It has never been done. I suspect it will never be done. As soon as they would put a list together, it'd be out of date, first of all. And it's such a large, complex project. What the bishops have done in Canada, of course, have, is that they have produced a national hymn book. Clearly, anything in CBW3 is approved by the bishops of Canada. They published the book. They approved it. The gray area is what about other books? Are the hymns in these other books approved? Well, that's gray area at the moment. And we, especially who live in close proximity to the United States, obviously are familiar with many other books that do not have the approval of the Canadian bishops. And yet, much of the repertoire is known. It's part of our repertoire in Canada. So that's a bit of the gray area. As we move forward over the next few decades, I suspect that there will be clearer and clearer uh, lists, if you will, or procedures for approving music. And so you just kind of kind of keep your eyes and ears open as to what is being approved uh, for liturgical use in Canada. Uh, in terms of, so that's just in terms of hymns in general. In terms of the communion hymn, it does mention it's sung either by the choir alone or by the choir or the canter of the people. Um, the, uh, theologically, we would say that the communion hymn, like the entrance hymn, needs to belong to the assembly. Again, maybe not sung straight through. And in fact, the communion hymn, the best communion hymns, are hymns with refrains. You'll notice that. Almost every communion hymn that's listed in CBW3, and, and definitely every communion hymn that is listed in Celebrated Song, has a refrain to it. Because we know it's difficult to ask the assembly to move and sing verses by heart without books. We know it's difficult for them to move with books and then try to sing and receive communion at the same time. So in Canada, what we've done is we have almost exclusively chosen music in our hymnals, both Catholic Book of Worship and Celebrate Song, that have refrains for the communion procession. And there are so many of them now uh, that you know, over the course of the year, you could almost, not quite, but almost sing a different one every Sunday and still have enough in the repertoire. Yes? Although this question isn't about choice of music, will you say something about when the communion chant should start? The communion hymn, or the communion chant, as it's called, it is begun, he 
immediately as the priest receives communion. Immediately as the priest receives communion. Pastorally, does that happen? Do we come close? Yes, many parishes do come close. Uh, the question, of course, is how can you start it immediately and at the same time uh, make provision for the choir or the music ministers to receive communion? And there are different solutions. Some parishes have the ministers receive immediately and then they begin singing. Some parishes have the organist or instrumentalist start the music while the choir is receiving communion and then they start singing uh, with the assembly. Some people, some parishes have the choir or music ministers receive at the end of the procession. Uh, there are so many options, so many different ways of doing it, depending on your church, depending on your ministers. But ideally, it starts immediately as the priest receives communion and concludes when everyone has completed. I'm getting the high time signs so we're going to go faster. The communion song. There is a possibility that a hymn after communion might be sung. This would presume that perhaps a song hasn't been sung during communion, or that there is a desire to have another song or canticle after communion. Uh, but it's not meant to be a performance by the choir. The second communion hymn, as it's described here, is a hymn that's sung by the whole assembly. My interpretation of that, my interpretation is, you would sing this with the whole assembly if there were not singing during the communion procession. If the choir is singing during the communion procession or it's instrumental music, then everybody would sing afterwards together. So somewhere in the communion rite, somewhere in the communion rite, everybody would participate in singing the communion hymn. Okay? You'll notice I did not mention the recessional hymn because there isn't one. You all do one. But there isn't one. It's not in the right. It simply says after the blessing, the priest and ministers leave. That's it. It's over. I had an experience in one of our high schools uh, after Easter. They celebrated two masses back to back because half the students would come for the first mass and fit in the gym, and then we had the second mass. At the second mass, I said, the mass is ended. Go in peace. Before the pianist's fingers touched the keyboard, one third of the students were up the room. They were very fine liturgists. They were very polite, but they knew the liturgy. It was over. Pastoral priorities, very quickly. And I uh, just got one slide for this. We have to ask ourselves, in light of the role of the different ministers, in light of what is called for by each liturgical moment, what kind of music, who's supposed to sing it, etc., what does this parish know? And what do they sing confidently? If you're selecting music and there's nothing on the list from the start of the Mass to the end that everybody knows and can sing confidently, your ministry is diminished greatly. People will not be able to participate in the sacred mysteries. Does the music help the assembly to pray, to have an encounter with God? Look at your text. Look at the music. Is the music appropriate to this moment? Is the style of music, is this meditative music, or more festive music, or engaging music? Is it uh, like a litany? What kind of music is it? And does it help people to pray in this moment of the liturgy? You have to ask yourself at some point, what is the new music that our community needs to learn that needs to be added to our repertoire? If, you're, if you have not learned at least one new hymn in the last year, maybe you should start looking for something. But then again, look for something that you can sing many times during the year. Not just, well, this is a great hymn for the baptism of the Lord, but we would, it wouldn't make sense to sing it any other Sunday of the year. It's not worth learning for one occasion. Find something that would add to the repertoire of your parish. 
Uh, I'm reluctant to say how many new hymns you should learn in a year because every parish is different. I would like to suggest that most parishes, in my experience, could probably learn three or four hymns in the course of a year. That's just my experience. Your parish may be quite different. I was the organist in a parish many years ago when I was in high school, and somebody told the pastor that it takes a parish two years to learn a hymn. And I played the same four hymns for more than two years. Hymns I never want to sing again. <laughs> uh, are the musicians in your parish capable of singing this? Perhaps as a choir director, you might find this wonderful piece of music and hymn where you say, we need to learn this. And the cantors are all just struggling with it. They can't get it. It's taken weeks to get it. Pick something else that they can handle and that the people are likely to handle. That's pastoral judgment. That's pastoral priorities. That's putting the people first, if you will, in your considerations. Or at least, maybe not putting them first, but paying attention to them, giving them their due. In terms of musical priorities, I would suggest that when you're planning music, start with the acclamations. Psalm, of course, we have a psalm every Sunday. Look at the dialogues and responses. When it comes to hymns, look for those two hymns that are most important because they express our unity, the entrance hymn and the communion hymn. Uh, then maybe consider litanies. Obviously, the litanies are not as important as the other things that are above on the list. And similarly, some of the antiphons. They're not as important. So in terms of order of priority, to start with the acclamations, psalm, dialogues, responses, those two hymns in particular, entrance and communion, and then work your way down to the piece of soul. In terms of musical priorities, we're just about at the end here, there should be an identifiable musical structure and form. Like, does the piece of music have a clear verse and a clear refrain? Or are all the verses the same melody? If every verse is different and there is no refrain, think of how long it's going to take for people to learn this, how difficult it is. Is it worth it? I mean, Congregational singing has to have some kind of a form to it that makes it accessible for people to sing. This is not choral music, it's assembly music. Does the music and the text go together? It's amazing how often uh, on the National Council for Liturgical Music, of which I'm the chair, we are sent music constantly for review. It's unbelievable the music we get, and how the text has got nothing to do with the melody. All the accents are on the wrong syllables. <laughs> Nobody could sing it that way. I like to suggest that the musical rhythm needs to match the spoken rhythm. How do you, which syllables do you emphasize when you speak the text? Are those the syllables that are emphasized when you sing the text? Uh, as an example of one of the psalms, we changed the pointing in CBW3 from what it had been in number two. In number two it was valise. Remember that one? It says Psalm 23, Lord is my shepherd. I can't remember it exactly off the top of my head, but it was valise. Well, you don't say valley, you say valley. So the accent needs to be on the syllable that we emphasize when we speak. Uh, the music needs to be pleasing, engaging. If everybody in church is going like this, pick another song, please. Now, if the babies are doing this, keep singing. But if the adults are doing this, cut it. Uh, does the music, good music, will move the singer to an experience of God. So keep those things in mind in terms of musical priorities. The last uh, musical priority I would suggest is the order. If I was picking music for summer mass, I'd start with the entrance chant, 
because I believe it's so important, I would look at the Gloria, the Responsorial Psalm, the Gospel Acclamation, the Eucharistic Acclamations, and the Communion Procession Psalm. Those would be the priorities. On any given Sunday, I would say those are the things that should be sung. Anything beyond that is great. It's nice to sing, and you can add more solemnity to it, but for basic, any Sunday, this I would suggest to you is the basic. So, it's your turn to do some homework. How you plan it. Can you check off all of these priorities in your plan? Are you attentive to the ministerial priorities, the liturgical priorities, what the liturgy demands? Are you attentive to your community, pastoral priorities? And lastly, are you attentive to the music, the quality of the music, and all of those musical issues I mentioned? So, balls back in your court. So I've tried to give you a very, I call this a Reader's Digest version of the uh, how we plan music, how we prepare music, how we select music. As I said, all of this and much more is found in the general instruction of the Roman Missal and the companion to the Catholic Book of Worship. If anybody would like a copy of my slides, uh, you can email me at, uh, I'll give you Chancellor, do that when it's easier. I'm trying to spell my name. Chancellor at HamiltonDiocese.com. And I'll send it off to you. Okay? Thank you all.